Hi, thanks for dialing in to my presentation today. My name is Aliona Medelian, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Thematic. It's an AI startup. And today I will be talking about how to start a startup if you are an AI engineer. And I will also share with you part of my journey. I also wanted to mention that I would love for you to connect with me on LinkedIn and Twitter and feel free to reach out with any questions and um, feedback on this presentation. I'd love to hear from you. So what do these companies have in common? Well, first of all, they all employ AI engineers and pay a lot for their, for their skills. They also have amazing AI technology, but they also buy AI solutions from other companies. In fact, four out of five of these, uh, of these companies have paid thematic significant amounts for our technology. And this is interesting because when I started thematic, everybody was saying, well, doesn't Google or Amazon and, or IBM already do this? Didn't they solve this problem already? Why bother starting a startup? And what I came to learn is that if you solve a real customer problem, the companies will buy from you. And while, why should you care? Well, most of you are engineers, many are AI engineers. Some of you may be working for these companies. And today I'd like to convince you that you should start an AI startup. Why? We'll get to this in a moment. Uh, but first I want to define the notion of an AI startup. And by the way, when I say AI, I mean machine learning, I mean natural language processing and deep learning. But since it's written in PowerPoint, I'm going to start keep using the term AI. So what I've learned is when people say AI startup, they mean different things. Let me explain the difference. And by the way, this is without any judgment. First, there are startups that provide AI as a service. And um, some of the recent examples here are companies like Hugging Face or Primer. And I myself have tried to create a startup in this way and failed. And I will share the story later. Second, there are AI startups where AI is the core of the solution to a specific problem that the startup is solving. And um, my current company, Thematic, falls into this category. The interesting part um, about these, this type of startup is that customers don't actually care that AI powers the solution. They simply want the, the problem being solved. Third, there are also companies that um, have don't um, initially use any AI, but when they have to raise funding or apply for, for grants, they suddenly add AI um, on one um, after the fact. And these startups are probably the least AI out of the four of these. Um, but again, no judgment. Finally, uh, there are also AI startups that are basically groups of PhD students working on cool stuff and they're waiting to be acquired. After all, it's ridiculously hard to hire a PhD in AI, uh, specializing in AI. It's expensive, it's competitive, and it's very difficult to build a team of these super smart people. So when big companies uh, need to, to get skills in, in these areas, they hire whole AI teams marketed as AI startups. And plenty of AI experts capitalize on this challenge, most notably George Hinton. Uh, this Wired article tells a fascinating story of how he sold an AI startup of three people for $44 million to Google. So today I'm not going to talk about this kind of startup. I'm going to talk about the second type of an AI startup with, where AI is part of the core solution. So first, a bit of background about myself. I have a master's and a PhD in computer science and natural language processing. And um, my background is probably similar to many of you here uh, who have dialed in. I love technology, especially natural language processing. In fact, I have dedicated the past 20 years of my life studying, 
publishing, consulting, and commercializing this technology. Ultimately, what truly motivates me is when people use technology that I have built to solve real world problems. So instead of staying in academia where I felt like I couldn't get to that point, I joined, I joined a startup as an employee number one. The startup raised over $10 million, but it failed to get traction. So I found myself leaving the startup three months um, into maternity leave and I was cooking up ideas for my next steps. And to be honest, I didn't even consider um, that I would start an AI startup and especially one that could compete on a global stage. Here's a picture of me in suburban New Zealand, which is where I'm right now as well. And I'm pushing the pram with my newborn baby and listening to podcasts about how to start a startup. Some of the, these startups were by Y Combinator, the birth of world's most successful startup. It felt completely out of reach, but little did I know that just a few years later, by complete coincidence, I would be invited to interview for Y Combinator. And together with my husband, who is also my co-founder, we were admitted and we realized that we could actually build a billion dollar company if we work really hard and have a bit of luck along the way. So fast forward a few years, and while we aren't yet a billion dollar startup, I'm proud of what we built so far and excited about the journey ahead. A company in our space called Qualtrics uh, recently acquired another company called Clara Bridge. It's one of the older and more, more successful NLP companies out there. They are our competitors and they've been acquired for $1 billion. So there's clearly a demand for what we do. So why should you start an AI startup? Well, um, if you want to, but you doubt that you can, well, if I, an immigrant mom with two young kids on the other side of the planet can do it, then you can do it too. And here's what really motivated me. First of all, um, it's not money. As a founder, your salary will be much smaller than uh, if you would be working in AI research at a well-funded startup, at one of the FANG companies, or even a bank. And when you start a startup, there's a high chance that your startup will fail and you end up with nothing. Um, but um, ultimately, as an AI engineer, if you start a startup that solves a real problem using AI, and you are the founder, you control your own destiny. And that was a big motivator for me after my experience uh, with um, in other endeavors. So what motivated me is, first of all, learning new skills. Um, when you are an AI engineer, so you feel like this is the only thing you're great at. But as a founder, you quickly discover other things that you're also great at and enjoy doing. Uh, personal growth is amazing. So you basically learn how to be a great leader, how to communi communicate your vision to others. You have to learn empathy. And personally, I became a much more confident person after I started the startup. Um, but most importantly, it's all about the impact. When you are an AI engineer and you start a startup, you truly learn to understand what technology is actually needed in the world and how it fills the gaps. And you are in charge in, of both building and making sure others use this technology. And while others might have a different experience, for me, doing research at Google or starting another startup as an employee, unfortunately did not result in great impact. At Google, I had this interesting story. So I was an intern there and I created a quick demo that uses the research based on my PhD and um, showed it to others. And somebody said, hey, can you make it work in Chinese? We have a huge growth in our Chinese blog search. And users could use this technology to basically find other blogs they liked. And I don't speak Chinese, but I still gave it a go. And luckily, Google has some amazing NLP libraries. And when you plug them into your solution, you suddenly um, your co code suddenly works in all of the languages. And my demo suddenly worked in language that I didn't even speak. And it was amazing. And it even became part of the main Google code base, but ultimately never saw the light. In fact, the whole Google blog search isn't 
there anymore. So for me, it was an impact fail. Then I joined that start uh, that startup I mentioned previously. I became their chief research officer, and they raised ten million dollars in funding. They had fifty staff. They even bought another company, but they got very little traction. Ultimately, they ended up running out of money and having to sell the tech that we built to new management to start over and build a product out of it. Again, it was an impact fail. When we started Thematic, before we even built a product, and we have barely even registered the company, two customers were paying us for using the prototype, which was a single Python file. And this is where I felt I could really, um, this technology is really needed and I'm making an impact even though we've only just started. So if similar things motivate you, you might be wondering, when is a good time to start an AI startup? Well, the best time is now. In fact, there's never been a better time. There's plenty of money. Key firms like Sequoia and Greylock and Andreessen Horowitz have just launched huge seed funds. This is when they invest into new startups that just were formed. They're just an idea and a team alone, and you can raise millions of dollars to help you kickstart your AI startup. But even if you aren't keen on raising millions and playing the VC game, Twitter is full of advice on how to bootstrap. And there are a ton of podcasts and communities for advice. And the new thing is to build on the open. And it's, it's really wonderful to see um, different ways of starting a startup. In addition, COVID has really leveled the field of both raising money and selling remotely. So you don't have to be in Silicon Valley or U United States. Um, there are also plenty of no code solutions combined. It means that you can start your startup and start testing your idea from basically anywhere. So um, how do you start a startup where deep tech uh, is used to solve a real business problem? For me, it's all about these three key steps. Number one, make sure you solve a real business problem. Two, learn to sell, learn to market. And three, focus on finding product market fit. Let's dig deeper into each of these. So um, the first one is actually the hardest if you are an AI engineer. We, we always fell in love in with the technology, but instead we should be falling in love with the solution, with, sorry, with the problem that we are solving. And it's very important to find a hair on fire kind of problem. And I love this analogy that Michael Seibel, the CEO of Y Combinator, uses to explain this. Imagine you are in a room and your hair is literally on fire. But there's nothing else in this room to help you um, put out the fire except for a brick. So you take this brick and you start hitting your head <laughs> and try to try to put out this fire. So. While the brick is far from a perfect solution to put the fire on, uh, on your head, you end up still using it since there is nothing better. Similarly, when you're starting a startup, you need to find problems where people use bricks. Ultimately, they won't care if you use AI or something else to solve their problems, as long as it solves it better than the brick. Second, you need to learn to sell and to market. Here, I want to share a story of how I failed first uh, when I tried to start AI as a service kind of startup. So I tried to commercialize the, my PhD work. I created a website, I created an online demo and started answering inquiries. And people were interested. And when I was showing them the demo, they, they said, oh, this technology is very cool. At some point, even NATO reached out to me and they wanted to buy the software. But for some reason, people um, weren't buying it. And basically, I had a solution in, in search of a problem, which is what, as I learned later, is a recipe for disaster in startup world. Then a friend gave me an advice. You need to take a, a sales course. 
Now, as an AI engineer, you might not think very highly of salespeople. And I myself have experienced some very cringy sales conversations, and I get it. But I also had two friends who had computer science degrees on, and who worked in the sales, and I respected them. So I followed the advice. And for me, it changed everything. Before, sales felt like magic. But in reality, I learned it's all about asking the right types of questions. And so what question do you ask to learn if it's a hero on fire kind of problem? So when you speak with a prospect, you need to ask them, so when do you need this buy? And there is one answer that indicates that it's a hair on fire kind of problem. When they say, ideally yesterday, from then on, you need to proceed to asking other questions to lead this prospect down, down the sales funnel. So I highly recommend that you take a sales course, um, can be just one over a weekend, or you read a sales book. Having a problem worth solving and a solution is not enough. That's another thing that people often overlook because there's a third component, which I call audience, that is required and where the real magic of startup success happens is when these three align. So finding an audience is basically finding people who will learn about your solution and the problem that you're solving. The most common ones is when you create content, you um, go to conferences to meet people, email marketing, you uh, partner with distributor of what you're building, um, paid acquisition ads, or you work with influencers, or you become an influencer yourself. So the moment you know you found a problem worth solving, you need to start working not just on the solution, but also on the audience at the same time. Don't leave it too late. Okay, and then your third step is to relentlessly focus on finding product market fit. So what is product market fit? There is a lot of misconception here. It's not about paying customers. It's not about being profitable. It's not about raising lots of money, series A, B or C. Product market fit is when you have a product that solves a real customer need at a price that's fair and customers are beating down your door to buy that product. In other words, you're trying to tighten up the relationships between these three components, problem, solution, and audience. To understand product market fit, it's best to focus on what product market fit, fit isn't. When you start a company and you haven't reached product market fit, everything feels hard. In particular, it's very fun, hard to find opportunities and find customers. And when you reach product market fit, it's like this boulder that you've been pushing up the hill is suddenly rolling down the hill. Or imagine you are inside of a plastic ball, rolling down the hill, trying to catch your breath and assemble your bits and pieces, which is basically zorbing, a fun activity we do here in New Zealand. It's not a joke. So, if you are a, an AI engineer, it is easy to get distracted by working on cool technology instead of pursuing product market fit. But you really need to focus on building what people want. You always need to ask yourself, what's in it for the customer? How will it help us find product market fit? So how do these lessons tr translate the thematics journey? Just so that you have an example and um, some sort of a case study. When we started thematic, um, our problem was helping customer experience people understand what drives net promoter score. Net promoter score or NPS was a key metric that was used in those companies as part of KPIs. So people were compensated based on how high that number is. And customers were telling people why they gave them a certain rating. So it was definitely a here on fire kind of problem. In terms of the solution, we used unsupervised theme discovery, sentiment analysis, and we had to link all of the themes that we find in customer feedback to the metrics to help them understand why the, why the NPS went up or down in a certain month and what do they need to do in order to improve it. 
And what we did to, to build our audience is um, first thing, we reached out to influencers. So people who understand the space really well. We asked them for advice. What do you think about our solution? And they really liked it. They started writing about us in newsletters, even in a book. And this is how we found our first Fortune 500 client. We were also publishing content. So people reached out to us when they read our articles in our blog, um, went to conferences, and we took part in corporate accelerators to get our first enterprise customers. Thematic today is slightly different because first of all, NPS is not in fashion anymore. So people don't believe in surveys and um, NPS isn't as often a KPI. So companies change, but the fact that customer feedback analysis is important is still, it's still um, important for, for example, product teams when they need to prioritize roadmap. So what we're finding is that we're analyzing less surveys and more chats, for example, Zendesk um, ticketing system or intercom chat where customers are contacting companies and share the problems that they have when using their solution. Our technology had to change as well. So we needed to develop chat analytics. We need to develop deeper, not just theme discovery, but also understanding which themes capture the intent of why customers actually reached out. And because product people need to use these insights to actually um, take an action, the summary of what exactly needs doing and what exactly is the problem needs to be much more specific than our original product. Also, COVID has changed how we travel. So we aren't going to conferences anymore. And because of our new audience, we had to adjust ways of how to best find them. So as you can see, finding product market fit, it's not a once and done kind of thing. It's things change over time and you always have to keep focusing on this. So if you are an AI engineer and you start a startup, you will never run out of opportunities to learn and we all love learning. So in conclusion, if you are considering starting an AI startup, do it. It's easier than ever to do it today because of funding and all of the resources that are more easily available. You will learn a lot, and, but make sure that when you do it, you solve a problem that is a hair on fire kind of problem. To help you with this, you need to learn sales, but don't forget to also start building your audience. And if you always focus on finding that product market fit, your impact will be significant. In my opinion, much more significant than if you work in AI research at one of the big companies. I also want to say that as AI engineers, we are extremely privileged. Even if our AI startup fails, our skills are in such high demand that there's nothing to risk, to be honest. You can always go back and get get the same job or um, become a consultant there's so many ways of landing softly after taking the risk and going on this great adventure of starting an ai startup so thanks for joining in i hope you've learned something and it was a pleasure to share my journey with you